have a couple of items for you at the top. And the secretary has a press avail scheduled right before 2. So let's get through as many as we can. Bill, give me a signal when he's about to start. Uh, secretary Kerry is on travel in Ottawa, Canada today for a series of bilateral meetings and to convey condolences to senior Canadian officials following last week's attacks. The secretary will meet with Canadian Foreign Minister John Baird and they will participate in a wreath-laying ceremony at the National War Memorial. He will also meet with Canadian Prime Minister Stephen Harper as well as members of Parliament. Obviously, this is ongoing, so some of these events have taken place. Uh, General Allen and Ambassador McGurk were in Bahrain today where they met with the King, the Crown Prince, and senior Bahraini government and military officials to discuss our shared efforts to degrade and defeat ISIL. The delegation thanked Bahraini interlocutors for Bahrain's participation in coalition airstrikes in Syria. They also noted important steps Bahrain has taken to halt the flow of foreign fighters, including monitoring ISIL sympathizers and declaring it illegal for Bahraini citizens to fight abroad. General Allen and Ambassador McGurk also discussed planning for the counter-terrorist financing conference to be held on November 9th in Manama. Countering ISIL's finances is a key line of effort in our comprehensive strategy, and we're grateful for Bahrain's leadership in bringing the coalition together to discuss areas of cooperation on this critical issue, including the full implementation of recent UN Security Council resolutions. General Allen and Ambassador McGurk also visited U.S. naval facilities in Manama, thanking the personnel there for who uh, make for their work uh, making coalition air missions possible. In their bilateral meetings with Bahraini officials, General Allen and Ambassador McGurk conveyed our, gr our gratitude for Bahrain's hosting of those facilities. They're now en route to Doha and will continue to Abu Dhabi tomorrow and Muscat on Thursday. With that, hello, Lara. Let's go to you. What's Jen. on your mind? Uh, just quickly, I wasn't going to bring this up at top, but since we're talking about Bahrain, I'm wondering if you all had any reaction to the court decision today shutting down the main Shia opposition group, mm -hmm. and if that came up during the conversations with General Allen and Ambassador McGurk. I'm happy to check uh, with his team on that specific question. I didn't have a chance to talk with them this morning. Uh, broadly speaking, we are concerned uh, by today's decision of the administrative court in Bahrain to suspend uh, the activities of al Faq National In Islamic Society for three months on technical grounds. Such a move runs contrary to fostering an environment of political inclusion. We're following the case closely and understand that the society plans to appeal the decision. It puts the U.S. in kind of an awkward position, doesn't it, if you're trying to work with Bahrain on one hand to get support to fight ISIS, and on the other hand, <coughs> Bahrain is shutting down a democratic um, process in the country. Well, as you know, Laura, there are many countries, uh, including Bahrain, where we have differences with. We've spoken out about uh, human rights issues uh, and others, and we certainly will continue to do that as we see fit. Um, we were also, let me just note, while I have the opportunity, disappointed by the opposition's decision to boycott the elections. Uh, we've, brought, uh, we've urged broad participation in Bahrain's upcoming parliamentary elections as an important and public means of demonstrating inclusiveness. But with any relationship, uh, strength uh, is shown by being able and willing to express uh, concerns and differences where you have them, both through private diplomatic channels when appropriate and at times through public channels when appropriate. Jen, how, how do you view the timing, especially that uh, General Allen was uh, there when they took the decision or announced it? I wouldn't make any connection on the timing. Uh, I don't have any particular analysis on that. Do we have any more in Bahrain? Should we move on? I wanted to also ask you about um, this new video out by the British photojournalist John Cantley, what the U.S. makes of this, what the assessment has been, and any conversations you all have had with the British government about this. Uh, well, we're aware, of course, of the video, uh, which the, the intelligence community is reviewing. Uh, we, of course, remain in close touch with our U.K. counterparts, uh, but we refer you to them for any specific comment, given it's related to one of their citizens. Does this have any kind of implication for any American citizens who might be held? Um, by ISIS. Sure, I certainly understand the question. I think we, though, are doing analysis, so I don't want to get ahead of where we are, uh, or where, I, most importantly, the British are on their uh, analysis. Uh, on Kobani, uh, the Peshmerga have uh, left uh, Kurdistan to uh, Kobani, uh, and they are in Turkey. Do you have any information uh, when they will be going to Kobani, and are you playing any role uh, in facilitating their uh, arrival there? 
Well, I, I think those reports just came out right before I came out here, uh, or that's when I saw them, I should say. Uh, as you know, we've been uh, supportive and uh, been uh, discussing uh, with uh, appropriate authorities, uh, whether it's uh, including Turkey, of course, specifically, uh, the facilitation of Peshmerga forces uh, across uh, the border. We certainly encourage that. Uh, we had heard or understood earlier today that they would be uh, deployed soon. I don't have any independent confirmation at this point, uh, aside from the reports, about where the Peshmerga forces are at this point in time. We can see if there's more to uh, convey to all of you after the briefing. Um, but as you know, we have worked closely with Turkey and the Kurdish regional government authorities uh, on a sustainable way forward to support forces in Kobani and over the long term to degrade and ultimately defeat ISIL. So that certainly has been our role in this effort. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of back and forth. Let's just do just one, one at a time. Oh, let's do one. Go ahead, Joe. And we'll go to Rasmus with you. Okay. On this issue, I don't know if you saw that there was an interview with the Turkish Prime Minister Davutoglu with the BBC today in which he suggested that he believes that talk of a no-fly zone is gaining traction. There's very intense diplomatic and military conversations going on. And he seemed to hint that he believes it's a question of time, not if but when this is going to happen. Is, is that your understanding of uh, a no-fly zone? Well, obviously, you are? we continue, as we have been for several weeks now, to discuss with Turkish authorities uh, what their proposals are, what they'd like to see happen. Uh, we have the same concerns that we've had in the past, so our position hasn't changed. I don't have anything otherwise to preview for you on that front. Uh, oh, I was meant to go to Raz, and then we'll go to you. Go ahead, Raz. Uh, but going back to the, uh, the deployment of the Peshmerga, <laughs> we've uh, been showing video of them in a convoy, and they're, they're on their way. But as recently as three days ago, the head of the PYD said what they really need isn't just people going in to fight, but what they still need are heavy weapons. Are the U.S. and other countries persuaded that giving the Peshmerga heavy weapons, as opposed to the small arms that were dropped into uh, the region last week, will make a difference in their ability to hold Kobani? Uh, nothing has changed on our view, Raz. Uh, go ahead. Uh, you know, Jen, there are only 160 Peshmerga fighters uh, that are going to Kobani today, and that's the number that Turkish government has approved of. But how can that really make a difference against thousands of ISIS fighters who are reportedly besieging the city? Well, as you know, uh, this is not the only component of the effort to degrade and defeat <coughs> ISIL and push back on them in Kobani. Uh, we have done a range of airstrikes that have increased over the past couple of weeks that have helped uh, push back on this effort on the ground. Turkey has continued to allow refugees in across their borders. So this is one component. It's certainly one that we felt would be uh, impactful and, and be uh, important uh, to have a partner on the ground to work with. But what kind of, like, do you really expect a major, um, like, do you expect the tide of the conflict to be turned? I'm not going to make predictions about the impact on the military component of this. Obviously, we've uh, advocated and been discussing the importance of allowing the Peshmerga across uh, the border and the facilitation mm -hmm. of that. Uh, we believe that will happen soon, or perhaps it's already happening. I'm checking with our team to see what we can confirm, if anything, from this. Just one more question. If we, uh, you know, this happened shortly after uh, the airdrops. Uh, there are co conflicting reports on what, you know, how did this, this come about in the first place. Some believe that the Turkish government did it on its own. Some other reports, I'm talking about local media reports in the region, they say the United States pressured Turkey to do this, to allow Peshmerga forces to go to Kobani. Can you clarify which one well, is true? Ultimately, it's the decision of Turkey uh, to uh, help facilitate. They made that decision, as they've spoken publicly about. Certainly, it's been a part of our discussion with Turkey over the course of the last few weeks. Thank you. Sure. It's very quickly. Um, I believe it was the same interview with the Prime Minister regarding um, to the extent, uh, there was some comments uh, that I believe he made saying that we are not going to send any troops to Syria or Kobani if no other coalition has done this or nobody else in the coalition. Well, the, the Pesha are, in fact, sending troops to Kobani to fight. So do you think this is kind of a convenient excuse for the Turks to not send troops, or is that something that the U.S. doesn't even expect Turkey to do at this point? We, we don't see it that way. At the for the first, the former just uh, description that you made, uh, obviously there's an ongoing discussion happening with Turkey and with countries in the region about what role they'll play. Turkey's role has increased over the past couple of weeks. 
Uh, we know this is going to be a long-term effort, but every country will make a decision about what role they'll play. And there are a range of other steps that Turkey has already taken uh, to be supportive of the coalition. What's Can you say if you have asked Turkey to send troops? It's more of a discussion about what role they are prepared to play and what role they're willing to play. And obviously, we'll let them make any decisions and announcements about what uh, their engagement will be. But on the other hand, they're also asking again for reassurances from the from Washington that you are prepared to sort of step up training, equipping, and fighting. That you have a strategy, a military strategy, for um, the eventual for, for aiding the Free Syrian Army and the eventual kind of ousting of. Um, uh, President Assad, what kind of assurances are you giving them on this line? Well, we agree that we don't want to see ISIL take more territory. We agree that we want to boost uh, the capacity uh, and the military credibility and capability of the Syrian opposition. Those uh, steps are in the interest of the United States as well. So I don't know that on that particular piece there's a disagreement. But they actually, I mean, they want a kind of commitment, it's so it seems or sounds, that they want a commitment that you are ready to engage militarily to oust um, um, Assad. Well, we have done hundreds of airstrikes, and we've been very clear that our focus is on uh, degrading and defeating ISIL, given the threat it poses to the United States. There's no secret about our position on that front. Uh, we've said it publicly, and we've discussed it certainly privately with any country who wants to. But they want it. you to go beyond that. They want you to go beyond the ISIL I to the FSA what their and the view is, But we have been. Uh, we just passed a train and equip program. We've been uh, increasing uh, the scale and scope of our assistance to the opposition. The United States has been doing as much or more than almost any country in the region in that regard. But our focus in this uh, effort strategically is on degrading and defeating ISIL, and that's what it will remain. So no change in that, even though the that Turks That hasn't would changed, like and that's something they've been talking about for some the, time, as you know. On this issue, he said clearly that uh, Turkey will not join the coalition if the coalition won't fight the Assad regime. I, I don't think these are new comments. Uh, there are, they've said, I know realize these particular quotes are, but these are comments that have been made for several weeks now. They've been increasing their engagement uh, in the coalition. <clears throat> not just in the military component, but in other components, including counterfinancing, tracking, cracking down on foreign fighters, anti-ISIL messaging. We're working with Turkey on all these components. We'll continue to discuss with them their role moving forward. Did you mean that they already joined the coalition? They have been making a range of contributions over the course of time. Well, how, how do you measure the, the train and equip program that is ongoing now? I mean, it's, uh, these, these kind of trainings take a very long time mm -hmm. for the uh, Syrian opposition to become an effective fighting force. Is there any way that you can measure how they are doing? When will they be participating? Where are they going to be participating and so on? Said, I would certainly point you to my colleagues at the Department of Defense for that. They obviously oversee the implementation of training and equip programs. But, you, but you're also working directly with them. And sure, I'm, we I'm are. I'm sure that you know the envoy is working with this opposition, and he's getting somehow he's getting a feel, or he's getting something on how they are doing, how effective they are, what is their likely participation in the future. I'm not sure what your question is. My question is, how do you assess the ability of the Syrian opposition? Because you keep saying the moderate opposition. We never really have a clear picture on who's this moderate opposition. It could be the Free Syrian Army. But if we take the Free Syrian Army, for instance, how do you gauge their effectiveness, their ability to sort of uh, uh, be cohesive and, and work together? Because in the past, the track record shows that they have been fragmented. Well, I think, Saeed, one of the reasons why we're putting in place this train and equip program, why Congress passed it, is because of uh, the important uh, role that capacity building uh, militarily will play in strengthening the opposition. We still believe there's only a political solution. There's not a military solution here. Obviously, part of that is certainly that assessment you referenced. But again, I'm not going to do that from here. That's more appropriate from the Department of Defense. OK, and, and my last question okay. on this issue, uh, who among your allies is taking a more active role in training and equipping? Is it Jordan? Is it Saudi Arabia? Who is really taking the lead? Uh, there are a range of countries who are participating and will play a role in the training and equip program, but also contribute militarily and for the other lines of effort. Go ahead. Just one more question, uh, like generally speaking on the Kurds. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know the Kurds have been a crucial player in the U.S.-led coalition against ISIS, both the Iraqi Kurdish forces and the Syrian Kurds. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I want to know how you characterize U.S. relationship with the Kurds. We know the Kurds are not 
they don't have their own state. Do you call it an alliance with the Kurds? What do you call this relationship that the United States enjoys with the Kurds? Well, uh, I think, as you know, we work obviously with um, a range of groups. Uh, Iraqi Kurds have been among our closest partners in the region going back decades. Um, that continues to be the case. Obviously, there are a range of groups, and different groups are characterized differently. So I'm not sure there's an overarching, there isn't an overarching sweeping characterization. We work with different groups, and some groups we don't work with. But is it like an alliance? Can you call it an alliance with Iraqi Kurds, for example? I wouldn't, qual I've qualified it exactly as I just characterized it. Uh, do you yeah. have any more on but, Iraq or Turkey? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Go ahead. On the program, the training and the equip program. I think that's the same question Saeed asked. Yeah, I don't the, have any update. It's, uh, it would be more appropriate to ask that question at the Department of Defense who's implementing that program. Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead. Just to follow up earlier question, uh, U.S. Kurdish uh, relationship, how would you characterize the relationship with the PKK right now? PKK remains a designated terrorist organization that hasn't changed. Uh, uh, is there any discussion regarding delisting the PKK at this point from? If there was, I wouldn't get into it from the podium. <laughs> Um, uh, you you just uh, talk about Turkey's role in the uh, in the coalition, mm -hmm. and you said that Turkey's contribution is increasing, and the Prime Minister Doğutoğlu says Turkey is not in the coalition. Just to clear the uh, uh, air, can we say Turkey is not partner but contributor? Is there any way you can uh, define us? I will, I will leave it to you to editorialize how you choose, but Turkey has been an important partner. They're a NATO, a NATO ally, and they have been uh, an important contributor to the coalition efforts to degrade and defeat ISIL. And one co question in Syria. Uh, Free Syrian army has been fighting with the Al-Nusra and Al-Qaeda group in Idlib for the last two days. It looks like the clashes are increasing and intense. Uh, Nusra pushed back the FSA brigades today. Uh, is there any plan by the U.S. to help the FSA uh, groups in, in Idlib since the, the, this fight is increasing between the Al-Qaeda and the uh, moderate? I don't have any military plans to outline for you or predict for you from here. Obviously, you know what our focus remains on. We've continued to increase airstrikes in Iraq and Syria. That will continue, but I don't have anything to preview for you. Scott, go ahead. Can I go elsewhere? Are you going to stay there? Oh. Okay. Okay. Let's just do a couple more on Syria. Okay. On Syrians that uh, are stranded in places like Turkey, journalists, doctors, and so on, they have no passport. The government refuses to renew their passports. Do they have any recourse? Are you aware of anything? U.S. That citizen? They, I'm not no, sure no, they're not U.S. citizens, Syrian citizens. Is there anything that they could do? I know you may, may not know this, but uh, what should they be, be doing? What should they do to obtain any kind of travel documents? Syrian right. citizens Syrian in Syria. Syrian citizens who have been, you know, disallowed the benefit of passport renewal. I, I'm not, of, I don't think the U.S. government is probably the right, uh, well, right I, source to ask that question. I will check and I mean, see if there's I, any more we can, can they, offer. Okay, let me rephrase the question. Mm -hmm. Can they go to the U.S. Embassy in Ankara and seek asylum? Obviously, as you know, there's an application process for right. that. Typically, individuals are within countries. The right. State Department doesn't Just run that, that process Thank fully. You. So I would point you to right. DHS Just and you. others if you have a specific question on that. Very Go ahead. Quick status check. Um, sure. Do you have any assessment on whether ISIS is in custody of chemical weapons or man pads at this point? I don't have any update to what I said yesterday on man pads or a couple days ago on chemical weapons. Which, I'm sorry, was what I missed. Um, you're talking about specifically the reports about Iraq. Right, right. Uh, I think it was that we were assessing it. I don't have any <laughs> new update on it. Okay. But you haven't can... confirmed either at this Correct. point. Correct. Yes. Jen, a news report said that uh, officials in Kurdistan, uh, Iraq, are involved in smuggling oil for the benefit of ISIL. Uh, are you aware of these reports, and what do you think about it? Uh, I haven't seen those reports. I can check with our team and see if there's anything more to offer. Scott, go ahead. Indonesia, mm -hmm. do you have an answer to yesterday's taken question I regarding do. the human rights allegations about the new defense minister? I do. Thank you for bringing it up again. So as you know, we raise uh, human rights uh, around the world, and we certainly never hesitate to do that. Uh, with this specific case, uh, we are certainly aware of the allegations of human rights violations uh, committed by the Indonesian army while uh, the general served as Army Chief of Staff. 
We are not, however, aware of any allegation that ties uh, def the defense minister ex explicitly to a specific human rights violation. <clears throat> uh, obviously, this is something that we uh, track and watch closely. Um, and I would also just note that Indonesia's military, uh, like the country as a whole, has reformed in significant ways over the past 16 years in line with Indonesia's democratic transition. This is something the United States has obviously uh, pushed for, um, and we expect that reform trend to continue from here. A question about another member of the new cabinet. The Minister of State Enterprises appear, was born in Maryland. Do you uh, know the – there is no dual nationality allowed, so – can you take that question? I'm citizenship? happy to take it. And what was your specific question, just so I make sure? Whether he was born, whether he's a. Or whether or this individual has renounced uh, U.S. citizenship. Let me, uh, let me yeah. check and see on that one, Scott. Sure. Uh, should we move to a new topic? North Korea. North Korea, sure. Um, yesterday, North Korea's ambassador to the United Nations met with the UN rights um, investigator on talks about, um, you know, there's, I think there's a, a report that's being presented tomorrow. Um, which could push for North Korea to face war crimes. Were you aware of the meeting? What is your take on it? And um, what are you expecting to come out of the uh, talk, the discussion tomorrow at the UN General Assembly? I was not aware of the meeting. I'm happy to talk to our team about it, and I'm not going to make a prediction about tomorrow. Obviously, as you know, uh, we have raised um, concerns and supported the um, efforts of the Commission of Inquiry. The Secretary did an event uh, raising uh, awareness for these issues when we were in New York, um, given our concern, the United States' concern. Uh, but in terms of the outcome tomorrow, I would point you to us -UN Is the United that. States behind the idea of referring um, North Korea to the ICC for war crimes? I'd have to check with our team on that, Joe. Uh, have you seen the reports that uh, North Korea may have uh, developed a viable missile testing facility? And if the U.S. has been able to confirm it, how does that change the U.S.'s concern about North Korea's role? Well, we have certainly seen the article. Uh, I'm not going to comment on intelligence matters. Uh, as you know, broadly speaking, North Korea's ballistic missile launches and continued development of its ballistic missile program and related activities uh, constitute clear violations of multiple U.N. Security Council resolutions and have been condemned by the international community and the U.N. Security Council. Uh, we continue to urge North Korea to comply with its UN Security Council obligations. Uh, as required by multiple uh, resolutions, North Korea must suspend all activities related to its ballistic missile program, stop conducting any launches using ballistic missile technology, and abandon its <coughs> ballistic missile program in a complete, verifiable, and uh, irreversible manner. Quick follow-up. Given the sanctions regime already in place against North Korea, where is it getting the equipment to build this facility where is it getting the materials to build this facility? Where is it getting the scientific know-how? Is it dealing with other pariah states in order to uh, make this facility a reality? Well, given I haven't confirmed any details of the article, I don't think there's much more I can say on this particular topic. Uh, North Korea? Sure, go ahead, Nicole. Okay, so, North Korea, go ahead. Um, have you been in touch with Japan about the delegations over there right now? And have you received any reports about them or have any re reaction to that delegation over there? Uh, I, we are in regular touch with Japan. Uh, I don't have anything to read out for you in terms of recent calls or meetings over the past 24 um, hours. Any update on Mr. Silas' trip over there? Uh, sure, I do, I do believe I have one on that. One moment. Oh, sorry. Uh, special envoy for six party talks, uh, Sidney Siler ha held a series of wide ranging and constructive discussions on October 29th uh, with Director General for North Korean Nuclear Affairs, Shin Jae-hoon, and with other Korean officials on a wide range of issues related to North Korea. These discussions are the latest in a series of regular ongoing consultations with our five party partners, all of whom remain united in pursuit of their shared objective, a denuclearized uh, North Korea. He also delivered remarks as the U.S. representative at the first high-level meeting of the Northeast Asia Peace and Cooperation Initiative. He'll travel to Beijing uh, later this week on October 30th to meet with senior Chinese government officials, and then he'll travel to Japan on November 1st uh, to meet with senior Japanese government officials, and he'll return to Washington early next week. Um, just one follow-up on that. Sure. Um, has Mr. Fowles' release had any impact on the, his trip? Uh, not that I'm aware of, no. And I would just reiterate that uh, the release of Mr. Fowle, which we certainly welcomed and celebrated, 
uh, does not change the fact that we have existing concerns, ongoing concerns, along with the international community about uh, North Korea's uh, nuclear program. Uh, should we, new topic? Go ahead, Nicole. I'd like to go to Israel-Palestine. Sure. Um, there have been media reports that Prime Minister Netanyahu rejected criticism of Israel's settlement policy, saying the criticism was the impediment to peace. Um, I was wondering if I could get this building's reaction to that. And secondly, I'm just wondering if there's a discussion or interest in going back to or trying to rekindle talks, perhaps after the midterm election is over or in the next few months. Well, on the first question, we've seen the Prime Minister's remarks. I think that's what you're referring to, um, his remarks earlier today. Right, yeah. Um, our policy has been clear for many uh, administrations. Uh, the policy continues to oppose unilateral steps that would prejudge the outcome of negotiations on Jerusalem. Uh, certainly, Secretary Kerry, I mentioned this a little bit yesterday, but he spoke with Prime Minister Netanyahu on Saturday. Uh, he conveyed very clearly what our view is on settlements. And the fact remains that if uh, actions are taken that are not conducive to peace, it makes it very difficult to not only return to a negotiation, but to obviously reach a two-state solution. Uh, in terms of the reconvening, that is going to be up in any scenario to the parties to determine whether they're willing to take the steps necessary to do that. Obviously, we will continue to be available and uh, advocate for the benefits of a two-state solution for the Israelis, the Palestinians, and for the region. But certainly, we can't do it for them. Mm -hmm. okay. but, uh, but he dismissed the criticism. And he basically said that building in Jerusalem is like you know, building in London or Paris or any of the other capitals. Do you agree with them? Do you agree that you know, they have the right to build as they wish in, in Jerusalem? Well, our, our view on construction uh, is longstanding, uh, mm -hmm. Said, and we've stated it many times here. We'll continue to express those views. Um, we've, as I mentioned yesterday, we continue to urge uh, both sides to uh, take steps that are conducive to a uh, the, what they state they want to achieve, which is peace in the region and, and a two-state solution. Mm -hmm. He also said <coughs> that if you keep criticizing the settlement, that is likely to give uh, the Palestinians uh, unwarranted hopes that they may not realize. Are you aware of his statement? I, I would say, Said, I would just leave it with, with what I said. I uh. think clearly uh, there are a range of issues that would need to be discussed. Uh, obviously, there are a range of difficult choices that both sides would need to make. Uh, as you know, we're not there aren't ongoing peace negotiations, and as you also know, we believe that's the only way to achieve peace in the region. Okay, also, uh, this, the Security Council just announced that they will meet tomorrow mm -hmm. to discuss the settlement e expansion and the settlement activities. It was done at the request of Jordan, which is a member of the Security Council. Now, will you, um, will you call on the Israelis to uh, call back or to you know, nullify their, their uh, earlier announcement about the expansion settlement. I think we've already conveyed our views. I did yesterday, I did today. In terms of the meeting tomorrow, obviously mm -hmm. those reports are, mm -hmm. were just coming out this morning. I don't have any more information on uh, what the well, agenda is or what the plans are for tomorrow, and I expect we can talk more about it tomorrow when we okay, know Okay, but if, if the uh, Security <laughs> Council calls on Israel to withdraw its plans, will you support such a, a request or such a demand? In this case. As you know, we don't typically get ahead of uh, actions that have not yet been taken and haven't even been laid out. Oh, do you think that any action in the Security Council will sort of uh, um, engender the kind of veto that we have experienced in the past? I'm the not going to make States? a sweeping generalization, Shade. We don't have uh, information yet on what the plan is. Um, the European Union um, also condemned the, um, the plan, saying that it calls into question Israel's commitment to a negotiated solution. But they actually went a step further, further than the United States has been prepared to go, saying that if it does go ahead, there's going to be consequences for EU-Israel ties, some of which we've already seen in the past with previous mm -hmm. um, announcements. Again, I guess this goes back to um, Matt's question of yesterday. I mean, is the United States prepared to put in place consequences if these settlements go ahead? I don't think I have anything to add to what I've stated about our view. But why not? I mean, wouldn't not if you you can say that, you know, you condemn the settlements that they're contrary to peace. I think you said it was yesterday incompatible with any peace plans. But if you don't back it up with any kind of action, then the Israelis surely could just go ahead and do it for as long as they like. Well, Joe, I would disagree with that. Obviously, there are a range of countries you just referenced uh, that have indicated uh, their plans to put in place consequences. Uh, Israel cares deeply about their place and role in the world. Uh, 
that's obviously something they factor in. They've stated they want to see a peaceful uh, society for their people. If they want to achieve that, then uh, there are steps that they should take uh, themselves. But so the United States is the biggest backer, single backer of Israel. If the United States move to do even halfway what some of the European countries are doing, would that not lend more weight to your calls to stop the settlement building? Well, Joe, I think I'm going to leave it with what I've said. Will there come a moment when the United States will say, you must stop settlements, or we're going to do X, Y, and Z, or is it going Joe to remain this, at the Joe level? Joe asked the same question. Let's okay, just try okay, to get a couple just, of other sites. Okay, just very quickly mm -hmm. follow up. The, uh, have you found out anything about the teenage uh, Palestinian-American boy that was shot? I have a little bit more in terms of the uh, specific technical answers that all of you were asking, so okay. let me run through a little sure. bit of that. Um, the Israeli National Police is handling the investigation on the death of the three-month-old American in the light rail attack incident. Uh, we're in close touch with the INP and understand the investigation is ongoing. We've asked for a speedy, transparent, and thorough investigation. For the teenager who was killed in the West Bank during a confrontation with Israeli forces, Israeli authorities are conducting the investigation. We have stressed to a number of Israeli government officials our expectation that there will be a speedy, transparent, and thorough investigation, and they have indicated to us that that <coughs> will be the case. Um, that is the update I have at this point in time. Um, new topic? Iraq. Africa, and then we'll go to Scott. Go ahead. Uh, from a uh, contingent of U.S. military personnel who apparently are quarantined in Italy including a two-star general. I think we addressed this yesterday. Go ahead, sorry. Just want Continue, to, maybe that wasn't your question. Yeah, I want uh, the general or the spokesperson for the group referred to, we want to make sure we don't bring back any gunk from Africa to the United States. So I'd like an explanation of, I assume gunk is referring to Ebola. Well, I'd refer you to the Department of Defense. Okay. I know they addressed this yesterday, and I'm sure they're They'd be happy to the second your question, question is, uh, is it, are there a series of bilaterals being negotiated with various countries in terms of where military personnel will be quarantined if they are coming out of Africa? I would again point you to the Department of Defense. Obviously, there were guidelines announced yesterday by the CDC that uh, impact uh, yes. the return mm -hmm. of American citizens or individuals who come to the United States. Uh, they did an extensive briefing on that. Uh, otherwise, uh, I know the Department of Defense has explained that this was an individual, not a sweeping uh, decision, but I would point you to them for more specifics about military personnel. Thank you very much. Yeah, just on that. Sure. It's not based on where Ambassador Power is at the moment, which country? Uh, let me see if I have that, Joe. I know US, UN. She, she started in Guinea, but I'm just wondering if she's moved on now to one of the other countries. I don't have that in front of me. I'm sure we can quickly get that to you after okay. the briefing. You just want to know which country yeah. she's in right now? Yeah. Sure. And, what, and I guess when the tour is going to wrap up. I think perhaps Sierra Leone, but let me check and make sure that's And then the I guess when, she, when the tour is going to wrap up, we should, might start becoming uh, susceptible to the any kind, any kind of rules. There. I know she's yeah. returning later this week. Um, I'll see if there's more in okay. terms of a specific day or time. Go ahead, Scott. Armenia. Yes. There are two Azerbaijani citizens who are on trial or facing charges of sabotage in the self-declared capital of Nagorno-Karabakh. Baku is demanding the return of their citizens. You are aware monitoring this situation and have expressed your concerns to either the Armenians or the Azerbaijanis. I do have something on this. One moment. Um, on these specific cases, uh, we really don't have a great deal of information on it. Obviously, uh, they are the experts. Um, we have continued to convey that it's important for the sides to take the necessary steps to lay the basis for a peaceful settlement to the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Uh, we call on all sides to redouble their efforts at the negotiation table to focus on the benefits that peace will bring to people across the region. In terms of our engagement in this specific incident, not that I'm aware of, let me double check and make sure that that's the case. Is it your opinion that putting on trial Azerbaijani in the uh, self-declared Nagorno-Karabakh capital is in line with taking those uh, moves? Taking the moves to... That you're calling on both sides to take? I think it's just a broad point we make. We don't have the, uh, all the specifics, so I think we just haven't weighed in more than that. Sure. Before Prime Minister Haider Labadi was sworn in, I remember Brad McGorg, your colleague, had a hearing uh, on the Capitol Hill. He's above me in the food chain, but keep going. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he told the um, senators that, quote unquote, it was unacceptable for Baghdad to stop sending the 
uh, revenue share of the Kurdistan region. He said it was unacceptable. But months have passed since he made that statement, and the Kurds don't receive their budget yet from Baghdad. I mean, one could wonder whether you know, the United States has done anything concrete to make sure that that decision by Baghdad would be reversed, or you just made that promise in order to make sure that you had a government in place to fight ISIS. Well, I would completely disagree with the premise of your question, which I'm sure you're not surprised by. This is an issue we have raised many times publicly. It comes up in meetings uh, that we have on the ground, and our position hasn't changed on this. We're continuing to press on that. Um, but uh, obviously, uh, it's up to uh, the uh, officials on the ground to, to make progress. But why hasn't Baghdad done anything? Is Baghdad not willing to listen to what you're telling them? I think, obviously, there are a range of steps that the central government is working to implement. I'd point you to them for more answers on that I mean, question. Considering that this is 17 percent of the budget, uh, why, in your opinion, is the Baghdad government withholding all that <coughs> for so many months? Saeed, you're familiar with the history here. Right. I would uh, point you to the government there. I don't have any more analysis for you. Can I return to Africa? Sure. Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. The U.S. government has long criticized as undemocratic the rule of Robert Mugabe, who's now enjoying his 34th year in power. I was wondering if the United States had any view on First Lady Grace Mugabe's indication that she may be the next uh, ruler of Zimbabwe, in part by describing the sitting Vice President Joyce Mujuru as ungrateful, power-hungry, daft, corrupt, foolish, divisive, and a disgrace. Well, on the first part of your question, uh, our view continues to be that internal rules and party uh, and a party constitution governs Zimbabwe's political parties, and party members should hold their leader, leaders accountable uh, for those rules. Um, we value a democratic process uh, and a result that is credible, a credible reflection of the will of the people. Obviously, it will be up to the people of Zimbabwe to pick uh, their next leader and not the United States, and we're certain they'll weigh all the factors. On a similar vein, sure. Zimbabwe, in Sudan, I don't know if you've seen the notice earlier this week that the uh, Sudanese president uh, Bashir, who's uh, wanted for war crimes, mm -hmm. just go back to an earlier theme, um, is is planning to stand again in the next elections. Does the United States take a position on whether this is a good idea or not? I had seen that report, though I haven't talked to our team, so why don't we get something for you? Okay, sure. On Egypt, very quickly, uh, mm -hmm. does the United States support this buffer zone that's being built um, on the border with Gaza? It's forcing the evacuation of many people there. I really had not talked to them about the specific okay. details on there. I'm, I'm happy to, to do that. Obviously, um, you know, we know, understand Egypt's concern about their security. That's why we have done taken steps like delivering the Apaches and things along those lines. But let me check on the specific border question. Thank you. Uh, all right, anyone else? One more. Go ahead, Joe. Um, just one very quick one. Hong Kong, the, the um, pro-democracy students who've now marking one month of their protests, uh, have decided that they are going to go above the heads of the Hong Kong authorities and call for direct talks with Beijing. Um, I guess they're not getting any traction with Hong Kong authorities. Um, given that you've stood behind the protests saying that you support universal suffrage, um, do you think this is a good idea, that they should go and talk directly to Berlin, uh, Beijing? Would you support that? Well, we've also said that we believe dialogue between students and mm -hmm. the authorities is the right step to take. Um, I hadn't seen that report, so we'll put that on the list of things <laughs> we'll follow up with you on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>